So you finally accepted Jesus into your life, but still no change. In the next episode of World on the Street with JP, we're going to take a look at a man, the Apostle Paul, and how he was able to go from living a life of deception and anger to one of patience and faith. From deception to faith, right here on World on the Street with JP. I'm your host, JP, and that's right. We'll see you on the radio. Welcome to another episode of World on the Street with JP. I'm your host, JP, and we have another <laughs> Power Pack show in store for you tonight. And we're going to talk about Saul, later on to become the Apostle Paul. It's an amazing story, and just by doing the study on this particular person in the Bible, man, I got a lot of rhema word, and God revealed to me the struggle of this man and how he persevered in order to be obedient to God, his new faith. Yeah, he's, he was just an amazing, an amazing guy. As hard as he lived in the world is as hard as he lived for Christ. And you're going to get some nuggets from this too as well. Before I go any further, I want to say that even though we're going to exalt the Apostle Paul, it's really all about Jesus. Everything in creation points to his kingdom and we'll find out when we get on the other side that it's about nothing else but him as a matter of fact the word of God says that when we receive our crowns for the things that we did here on the earth for the kingdom of God we are going to be so awestruck at his majesty that we're just going to take our crowns off and cast them at his feet awesome I am a a living testament to his goodness and I want to go right into this I'm going to read a lot of the word today I'm not going to mince and I'm not going to take any shortcuts because I believe that rightly dividing the word is 99.9% .9 of the message and that's one thing that we don't do as believers anymore is we don't get in our word we finish with our Bible on Sunday we go to the car throw it in the back seat, go on out to dinner, <laughs> and then you're looking for your Bible on Thursday, and you realize, wow, it's still in the back seat. So just a reminder, stay in your word. The Bible says, hide the word in your heart that you might not sin against them. So a lot of times we commit sins of omission, because we don't even know that what we're doing is wrong. When I first got saved, I didn't know that not controlling your thought life was um, leading to sinful acts. And so uh, we got to be rooted and grounded in the Word. And so when negative things happen to us here in our circumstance, we know how to react. And we will know not to put our mouth to it as our mouths have the ability to create and to destroy because the word says there's life and death in the power of the tongue and so yeah so I just I went right on in so <laughs> welcome to the world on the street with JP I'm your host JP again and the title of this message is a journey from deception to faith and that's the journey that that Paul took one from deception to faith and he got an opportunity to be transformed on the road to Damascus. He got his opportunity to be transformed on the road to Damascus when he was on his way to do sinful works against the body of Christ. So, a journey from deception to faith. From Saul to Paul, the most prolific transformation and if Paul can make such an incredible transformation, then who's to say that we can't do the same? For the Word of God says that all things are possible with God, and that is found in Matthew, the 19th chapter, 23rd through 26th verse. 
So if you think you're too far gone and you've accepted the Lord into your life and nothing's happening, then just know that according to Philippians, the first chapter, the sixth verse, which says, being confident of this. So we even have to have faith during our transformation, during our conversion, rather. It says Philippians, first chapter, six verse, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So be encouraged that you're walking down the aisle to accept the Lord was only the beginning. And I tell you, I remember the day. Mine was an amazing transformation because when I opened my eyes from saying the prayer where I accepted Christ into my life, things did seem brand new to me. Not sure if that was just a fig newton of my imagination, but maybe I wanted things to be new so bad that it carried into the physical realm for me. And so don't walk alone in your faith, though. If you're a new Christian, then ask God to send you iron, somebody that's strong in the Lord. Don't be ashamed to be discipled. And a lot of times being fresh out of the world, our pride is still very much alive. And coming from selfishness to selflessness is a hard transformation. It will happen over time, but it's a day-by-day -day decision that we as believers need to make in order to humble ourselves. The word says, humble yourselves before the mighty hand of God, and in due time, he'll exalt you. And those people that you are calling Jesus freaks, now you're following them as they follow Christ. It's like yin and yang, man. It is the most amazing journey that you could ever take being a believer of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because he is an amazing dude. Okay, so <laughs> okay, so don't walk alone in your faith. Find you a Bible-based church that you can get involved with. Ask God that within the walls of that church or within the gathering of those individuals together, he would send someone to you to guide you from baby steps to being a child of God. Okay, in 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, 9th through the 11th verse, we're going into Paul now. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, when we find Christ and get saved, we become righteous, not of our own volition, but Christ makes us righteous. His blood at Calvary deems us righteous, so God doesn't see our infirmity he doesn't see our sin he doesn't even see our sinful nature because Jesus is still in ministry today standing in intercession for us seated at the right hand of the Father he's still doing his thing for us and so again it's all about Jesus but we're going to toot the horn of the Apostle Paul today so let's read that again 1 Corinthians the 6th chapter the ninth through the 11th verse says verse 9 Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, verse 10, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God, verse 11. And such were some of you. And so these are the words of the Apostle Paul. Basically what he was doing is he was saying, all that bad stuff that I did, the blood of Christ has covered me to the point to where he considers me righteous by faith. So he's describing all of these sinful natures that exist within us as people wearing this earth suit in this world. And he says, when we find Christ, we're changed. And so he says, and such were some of you. But you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so, be encouraged. We are going to, to take a close, close, close look at Paul and not only what he did as an apostle, but we're going to take a look 
down the road of his development and it's going to blow you away the kind of fella that this guy was. So he was originally known as Saul. He was a great persecutor of those who followed the way. And so that's what followers of Christ were called in the beginning of the church. Soon after the crucifixion of Jesus, they called themselves the way. I don't know if it was a code word, but they were reluctant to call themselves followers of Jesus back then because there was actually a bounty on their head because of folks like Saul. He was the the bounty hunter. He was tracking them down and he was imprisoning them to the point of death. And so I could just imagine how it would have been to be a believer or not even be a believer but maybe be a friend of a believer and be seen with a believer so there was probably a lot of collateral damage I'm sure a lot of innocent people got got imprisoned and even killed unjustly and so so it was originally known as Saul he was a great persecutor of those who followed the way or the teachings of the crucified so-called self-proclaimed Messiah which we know he was self-proclaimed because he was God proclaimed he was God in an earth suit, Jesus our Savior. Saul was commissioned, financed, and sanctioned by the chief priest. He searched for, found, imprisoned, and even put to death believers of Jesus, and he was highly successful. He was infamous at his job. He had the resources of the synagogue. He had um, the approval of the high priest and the Pharisees to track these people down and he operated with impunity in killing people that followed Jesus. He was ruthless, a gangster. He was highly successful. He hailed from a place called Tarsus, which was a city on the border of Syria and Turkey. It was a very aristocratic city because of the university that was there and it was an economic hub and very, very um, cosmopolitan and distinguished was Tarsus. And Saul was a Hebrew by birth and very devout to the point of being a zealot. He was basically a religious extremist back in the day. He was Roman by citizenship which gave him preferential treatment and access to those things that Hebrews wouldn't under any other circumstance have access to. Um, the Hebrews were considered to be a second class people in the Roman Empire and they were treated as such um, on a daily basis. Does that sound familiar anyway? <laughs> okay, so by conviction, Paul was a Pharisee. He was bred to do what he was doing to, to judge a matter concerning the law. If he found it to be heresy or blasphemy, he and the other Pharisee could pronounce judgment on a person, whether they were right in their decision-making process or not, and the judgment and verdict stuck. Most of the time, it was a death sentence for the person that was being, um, being judged. So, this guy was, was a Pharisee following in his wealthy parents' footsteps. They were Pharisee as well. And they were, they were so wealthy that they sent this guy off to Palestine at the age of 13 to study the law of Moses under a, a theologian named Gamaliel, or Gamaliel, however you want to pronounce it. I call it Gamaliel, who was one of the greatest theologians of his time. Under these teachings, Saul mastered the law to the point where he actually became a lawyer. Great intellectual and a debater he was, and he operated in Roman fashion. So so he, he enjoyed the rights of a Roman citizen, even though he was a Hebrew. This would set him up to take the obvious position of a Pharisee, which he did. There was little room for compromise with this cat, which made him a religious, like I said before, extremist. So nothing's new under the sun. We see religious extremists killing Christians today. And enough said about that. They sent him to Gamaliel 
because he they, number one they wanted him to be rooted and grounded in the law and that's the reason that Jesus came was to fulfill the law so as they continue to operate in the law the new message the gospel which is one of love faith and grace was not accepted by by the Hellenistic Hebrew and uh, and so they rose up to the point of violence and began to kill those who they thought were contaminating the law. Wow. So they sent him so he wouldn't be contaminated by the Gentiles and their new belief and conversion in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So this facilitated Saul's development as number one, a religious zealot, number two, a wealthy aristocrat with a Hebrew lineage of the tribe of Benjamin so that was that was something that he could lean on when pronouncing judgment or having a diatribe with a believer um, and so this made him prejudice against the Gentiles how many y'all know that okay so um, we see an ethnic group we automatically think that they worship this way and so rather than going into into details we'll just be prejudiced against them just because of you know what we perceive and so and so I'm sure that's what he did and so he was prejudiced against the Gentiles the whole thing started out because of the stoning of Stephen Stephen was an awesome fella um, Stephen was a foreign born Jew he lived in Jerusalem and became a believer of Jesus in Acts the sixth chapter Stephen is introduced and Acts the sixth chapter verse one says and in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied so the church was growing the followers of Jesus Christ were growing there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews so the Greeks started having a problem with the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration so in Jewish custom, the synagogue and the community have an obligation to take care of women that have lost their husband. <clears throat> so the Grecians started having a problem with the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in regards to what they should um, receive or uh, what they were entitled to as a widow. Then the twelve the, the disciples called the multitude of the other disciples that were because it was growing unto them and said it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables so so he said we've got so much on our plate if we can't serve the widows because evidently this thing is being neglected we have to commission someone within the body of Christ to spearhead of this endeavor and so they said they, they're not going to leave preaching to serve to be a waiter at tables to be handing out food wherefore brethren look ye out among you seven men of honest rapport full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom whom you may appoint over this business so they're actually looking for people that can take on this this task for them verse 4 but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word and the verse 5 and the saying please the whole multitude and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost, and Philip and uh, Procurus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, verse 6, whom they set before the apostles. So they had a meeting of all the ones that they chose to kind of check them out, make sure that they were straight. And when they, when they had prayed and laid hands on those who they chose, verse 7, and the word of God increased. And so, so they were able to to spread the gospel more frequently because they had taken that that uh, the daily ministration of the widows off of their place. When they chose them and met with them, they prayed to make sure that God would give them the green light for this. And so, so the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. So he was a dude like out in front. He's like stuck out, head and shoulders above the crowd. 
you could tell that he was a powerful guy to the point to where he got the attention of the high priests and the Pharisees. Wow, sometimes, sometimes the Holy Spirit, obvious in you, will not only bring you in the midst of mighty men that are of the faith, but will make you a target, will put a target on your back. And so this is the case here. So we go into verse 9. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, like I said, which is called the synagogue of Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia disputed with Stephen. So now they, they starting to have a problem with old Steve. And but he's not a he's not a wuss. He's gonna go ahead and and um, speak his mind according to the word which offends them greatly. So I'll continue on in verse 11. Then they suborned men to, to set him up. Um, in verse 11, it says, Then they suborned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemies and words against Moses and against God. In verse 12, And they stirred up the people. They got everybody all riled up and the elders and the scribes and came upon him. They came after this cat. And and caught him and brought him to the council. So they they just took him right to court, <laughs> you know. And verse 13, and set up false witnesses to testify, which said that this man ceases not to speak blasphemies uh, against the holy place and the law. Verse 14, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place. So they're taking everything all out of context and shall change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Verse 15, And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw a face as it had been the face of an angel. So he's sitting there looking just as innocent, and they are they are blaming, this, they're setting this guy up to take a fall, a hard fall to the point of death. Okay, in light of, of all this, the temple leadership was so corrupt, that surely these teachings of actually having a relationship with God were considered blasphemy. But in actuality, they knew this movement would eventually negatively affect their earning potential, especially of those that were prone to taking advantage of those devout but deceived. So not only was it the ways custom to take care of the widow, it was the synagogue's custom it was Hebrew custom, it was Jewish custom to take care of of the widows. So all of a sudden the widows are, are falling short. So uh, speculation is that some of the high priests, some of the high priest guys and the high priests and some of the folks that worked there in the synagogue um, kind of had their hand in the cookie jar. This was the big, this is what started the whole thing. So didn't the, the synagogue have responsibility to take care of the widows as well? Who was blocking the widow's pipeline? Hmm. Yeah, that's right. Probably the temple hierarchy. Okay. So grace instead of the law would inspire the escalation of sin was their argument against Stephen and against Jesus. What they didn't realize was that the perfection of grace automatically empowers one to keep the law, but they continued to preach the law and were offended that the law had been fulfilled through Jesus our Lord. And so that was the that was the core of the of the issue. They just used the daily administration of the widows to have an have an excuse or an opportunity to get in the face of the believers. And that's what sparked the, the stoning of Stephen. Consequently in Acts seven Stephen is tried, found guilty, and is taken out to be stoned. Since Saul, who would later become Paul, was a Pharisee, he would have most likely been on the council that pronounced judgment on Stephen and sentenced him to death by stoning. He was so zealous that he spearheaded the whole execution, that's speculation, but we assume that he spearheaded the whole execution, or why would those who were commissioned to commit the execution bring their extra clothes and coats to him so he could um, watch them while they committed this heinous execution. 
Um, so he held their garments and why they carried out the sentence. Yeah. Uh, but Stephen died true to the game. He stayed true to Christ. He was killed because he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. In Acts the seventh chapter, the fifty eighth verse, it describes how it all played out. In true Pharisee fashion, they exercised a religious diatribe with Stephen, but to their surprise, he didn't. He didn't break. He didn't back down, um, nor he didn't mince his words. According to to this uh, this verse, in the defense of his ministry, he stayed true to the game. In verse fifty five, it says, "But he, being full of the Holy Ghost." looked up steadfastly. So he was doing this while they were falsely accusing him. So he's looking up into the heavenlies, steadfastly into heaven and, and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, verse 56, and said, he said this out loud, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Who you know they ripped their garments when he said that. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one car, so they rushed this dude when they heard what they considered to be blasphemy and cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet like I said before whose name was Saul verse 59 and they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying Lord Jesus receive my spirit so Stephen even though he was getting pummeled see I've been Anyway, if you've ever witnessed a stoning, they're not throwing little pebbles. They're throwing, you know, they're throwing rocks. I mean, they're throwing rocks as big as your head. And most of the time it takes two hands to throw the kind of rocks that they're throwing. They're, they're stones they're throwing. And with every blow, bones break. That's how they stone. They don't just... You know, throw little, little, you know, little pebbles. They getting down with it. They put some stank on it. And so they stone Stephen, calling upon God. Stephen said, "Lord Jesus, receive my spirit." So he stayed true to, to Jesus to the end. Verse sixty, and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, "Lord, lay not this sin to their charge." And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Yeah, wow. Jesus took the sting out of his death for him. Yeah, he was true to the game until the very end. He left it all out there on the court. It cost him his life, which he gladly laid down, depicted in these verses. Not only did he die for Christ, he died like Christ, following his amazing example of love and forgiveness to the very end. Amazing, devoted and true he was until he, uh, he drew his last breath. Genesis 50, the fifth, well, the 50th chapter, the 20th verse says, But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. So because this happened, it brought a lot of people to Christ because ultimately saw the persecutor of the, the way the followers of Jesus would become the most prolific apostle that there was. As hard as Paul played in the world, he played harder for God, and he was an amazing guy. He was a he was infamous in his murderous attitude towards the Christians. But when he made his conversion, then the journey began. How could the teaching of a man from Galilee, a carpenter, have seduced so many and was so radical that some even argued that it was introduced to make null and void the teaching of Moses and the prophets? But in their pride and blindness, the message of this so-called self-proclaimed Messiah was being fulfilled and was in its very essence a lesson on love and forgiveness. One that some argued would cause most to stray from traditional rabbinical teaching and spoke against self-effort. Whatever the speculation, this would have a huge effect on the, the Saul of Tarsus guy. <laughs> 
even though this witnessing of Stephen's brutal execution would have a lasting effect on him, he basked in the success of his actions, which were rooted in pride and vainglory. So he had a conscience, but the fame was overwhelming him. And so we see that in today with a lot of the entertainers. They're, they're born and raised in the church, filled with the Holy Spirit, but the money caused them to make music that they don't even agree with. Same, same thing. This is just an example. And so this guy had a conscience, but he was overrun by his infamy. What was even more powerful was that deep down inside, there was some spark of, of abiding compassion, and it moved him when he heard Stephen pray for him while Stephen was being executed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you got to know. God always tills the ground before he plants the seed. I'm sure that was a situation where God was, was giving him a heart of flesh. So, what do you do at the moment that you realize that everything you've done up until now was wrong? That had to be the question that plagued him after he realized that Jesus was real. So let's take a look at those events that would have made even the most evil of men take a step back. Stephen was the victim of not only a setup that would prove to cost him his life, but was possibly used to cover up the neglect of the widow's daily ministration as it was the responsibility of all Jewish leadership to see that these things be accomplished, not just the Hebrew followers of Christ. Um, why would the issue arise if their needs were being taken care of by either the disciples or the synagogue? Third, he had just put a man to death for simply having a radical belief, but a belief consistent with the teachings of the prophecies found in the law, not realizing that all was being fulfilled in great detail, but just not as some thought it should happen. Their grandiose imagination had created an expectation that couldn't be realized. So instead of trusting God that he would bring these things to pass, they entertained their own vain imagination of how they thought these things should transpire. So they thought that the Messiah would come down and he would automatically wage war, you know, against the, the, um, the powers that be, the Romans. He would defeat them, set up his kingdom right there in their eye shot. And, um, and then everybody would live happily ever after. That's how they thought it would come. But Jesus didn't come as a lion. He came as the lamb. He came not to do. He came to prove. His whole thing was repent. Repent being the action that one would take to prove their love for God. And so eradicate the sin in your life that you would be pleasing to God and God would be pleasing to you. That was the message. That was the message of John the Baptist. That was the message of Jesus. Jesus came teaching love. And so up until then, the law of Moses had become a list of rules. So they got away from the love of God and the love that God had for them before he as he parted the Red Sea, he, he proved his love um, when, they were, when they were escaping Egypt. As he um, followed them around with a, um, with a pillow of fire to prove his presence would always be with them. How he fed them, you know, um, with, uh, with quail and manna when they murmured and complained, abiding in grace, he kept them until they asked for the law. So I, I don't want to go way over there. But Jesus came to fulfill the law, not put an end to it, but to return those who believe in him to the grace of God. And so grace isn't an excuse. This is what my pastor always says. Grace isn't an excuse to sin. Grace is the empowerment not to. 
Because when you come to a place in your relationship with God, that it's just like having a wife that you love, a husband that you love, and you know that she, he, don't like anchovies on the pizza, but you love some anchovies. And so when they say, yeah, honey, order the pizza, you're going to order one without anchovies just for the one you love. And so that's how we eradicate sin within our lives. The Holy Spirit guides us in those things. If we hide the word in our heart that we, that we don't sin against him, then when those opportunities to sin come up, we'll choose against it and do what's pleasing to God. That's what grace is. So. So thank you, Holy Spirit, for that. So, so yes, yeah, Stephen had just been executed. Saul had witnessed this. Saul showed a little spark of compassion, but his infamy overrode that, and he rose up in his pride. He just having set this guy up to be murdered so they could facilitate a cover-up of their theft towards the widows of the of the faith. Ah. <laughs> so God is true to his promise and the Pharisees also didn't realize that they found no value or faith in God regarding the process that Jesus was trying to implement on the earth which was love. And he says love conquers all. He's the basis to so God is love. God, God doesn't love. God is love. He's love in a person. Love persona, he's pure love, like like this is gold, or this doesn't isn't overlaid with gold, this is pure gold, God is pure love, he doesn't love, he doesn't have love, he is it, embodied, so anyway, so Christ would come as a king and set up his kingdom, is what they thought, but he would accomplish it through love, you know, for one another as well as through faith in God. So he was radical in what he was saying, but accurate to the fulfillment of those things prophesied in the law. Okay, not with a coup did he want to take over this government. He wasn't trying to do that. They didn't realize that him coming back as the lion, the king, as they could recognize it wouldn't happen in their era. So they misunderstood, became religious zealots and extremists of their time. Okay. So I went to a website that, I mean, I did a lot of study trying to figure out the personality and the motive of, of who would become Paul. And so I went to, in order not to plagiarize, www.gotquestions.org forward slash Damascus dash road dot html. And I got this, Saul's conversion to Paul. It really, according to the word, was, was accurate. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read this. So what happened on the road to Damascus. Okay, so let me set the stage. To Saul witnessed the stoning of Stephen, he got word that there were there were a whole lot of believers in Damascus. So what did he do? He set out for Damascus so he could continue to persecute the believers because there were a lot there and he was going to really make a name for himself. Okay, so what happened on the road to Damascus? And what is the road to Damascus experience? So the answer is <clears throat> the events that happened on the road to Damascus relate not only to the Apostle Paul whose dramatic conversion occurred there, but they also provide a clear picture of the conversion of all people. Absolutely. While some have an extraordinarily dramatic conversion known as a Damascus Road experience, the conversion of all believers follows a similar pattern of Paul's experience on the road to Damascus described in Paul's own words found in Acts the ninth chapter, the first through the ninth verse. I'll say that again. Acts the ninth chapter, first through the ninth verse. Acts the twenty second chapter, sixth through the eleventh verse, and Acts the twenty sixth chapter, ninth through the twentieth verse. Putting the three accounts together in details of this amazing experience come together. Paul, 
who went by the name Saul at that time, was on his way to Damascus with a letter. This dude went and got a letter from the high priest of the temple in Jerusalem, giving him authority to arrest any who believed in the way. <laughs> Meaning those who followed Jesus. So intent was he on opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth that had been executed on the cross three to four years earlier. Acts the 26th chapter, the ninth verse is where that's found. That in raging fury he breathed threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Here was a man who truly hated Christ and all who associated themselves with him. Suddenly a bright light shone on Saul, causing his entire party to fall to the ground. Everybody saw it. Then Jesus spoke to Saul, asking him in an audible voice, why are you persecuting me? In a voice understood only by him. Saul recognized that this was a deity of some sort because he called him Lord. And he asked who he was. When Jesus identified himself as the very one Saul had been persecuting, one can only imagine the terror that filled Saul's heart. He'd been killing folks left and right, making sport of it. And now the, the God of all creation Asian, oh my gosh, <laughs> comes to have a word with him. I'm sure his heart stopped for a second. Paul was speechless, no doubt, thinking to himself, I'm a dead man. Yeah, I bet you did. Acts, the 22nd chapter version of the story, indicates that Saul's response was to ask what Jesus wanted to do. <laughs> and Acts, the 9th chapter, and Acts, the 20, I mean, 9th. Yeah, ninth chapter in Acts, the 22nd chapter, retellings of the same story have Paul saying Jesus told him to rise and go to Damascus where he would be told what to do. This dude fell in line immediately, I'm just saying. In Acts, the 26th chapter, the story, which is longer and more detailed, Saul describes Jesus' commission of him as his messenger to the Gentiles which must have amazed Saul, the ultimate Gentile hating Pharisee. So he commissioned this guy right away to go take a message to the Gentiles. So he, so Jesus addressed his persecution and asked him, why are you doing this? And then Saul just cut to the chase and was like, what you want me to do? <laughs> you know, I'm busted. What, what can I do for you? And so Jesus told him, to be his messenger to the Gentiles, which must have amazed Saul, the ultimate Gentile hating Pharisee, to turn many from darkness, his commission was to turn many from darkness with his message to the light and from a power of Satan to God. His message of forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith must have also astonished Saul because the Jews were convinced they alone had the place of honor in God's eyes. For Jesus to, to show the, the exact same love for the Gentiles that he's shown for the, for the Hebrews probably was, was an eye-opener because Jewish custom, they believe that they are the chosen people. And the word says that they are. But God made the opportunity to to serve him available to the to the Gentiles because the Jews were having it on a grandiose scale. There is no discrepancy or contradiction among these three accounts. So so Acts the twenty second chapter, Acts the ninth chapter, and Acts the twenty sixth chapter are consistent with one another. Even though Saul received his commission from Jesus on the road, he still had to go into Damascus and be told what to do. Because Jesus, because God, who is, Jesus is God, but because God uses men. That's why he says love one another. He wants us to get, to, to get it right with one another. So even though Saul received his commission from Jesus on the road, he still had to go to Damascus and be told what to do. Meet with Ananias, who laid hands on him, receive the Holy Ghost, be baptized, and be received by the disciples. <laughs> Okay, so you got this cat. This is long before cell phones and pay phones and CB radios and telegraphs and telegrams. There was no way 
to have an immediate communication with anybody that wasn't in your eye shot. And so Saul just became Paul. He just made this amazing transformation. Now he's looking for this cat named Ananias. But but see, God is amazing. God warned Ananias that Saul would be coming to <laughs> make his complete his conversion through discipleship from Ananias. Can you imagine? You know how how sometimes we hear something from the Holy Spirit and then we say in jest, but we really mean it down in the city of our soul that who the devil is a lie. I'm sure that was Ananias's reaction when he got the message from God that Saul would be coming to him as a new convert. I know his temptation was to flee because Saul was a heinous murderer. <laughs> I just sit there and just have sympathy, have, yes, yeah, sympathy for for Paul as well because Paul has made this amazing transformation. He's trying to get discipled by those who actually walk with Christ. And can you imagine a messenger running for three weeks to give the disciples a message that Saul has has become a convert and is looking for them? Can you imagine the doubt that would overcome them and how there's like, they'd probably be like, okay, so he's a convert. You know, just to be safe, let's go ahead and, and dip. <laughs> so when he get here, we won't be here. Can you imagine how I'll just say it, this is this is the, the way this is a way that you can readily understand what I'm trying to say. It's like it's like a skinhead who is racially biased against everything not Anglo <laughs> gets saved and then wants to come to your Southern Baptist black church with his friends. Are you gonna postpone church for that Sunday <laughs> because you don't really have faith in his conversion? Probably. Or you gonna come to worship service with your thing thing on you. I'm just saying, you know. So just in case. And so I'm sure that was their thought process. They're semi running from Paul or who they knew to be Saul because they weren't altogether believing in his conversion. They thought it was a setup to get to the inner circle of the leadership of the way. So <laughs> I just giggle at that. I'm sure he chased them down until they finally were convinced that he was a convert. They didn't start believing him until they started getting word that he was being persecuted and hunted down himself. So we said that there's no discrepancy or contradiction among these three accounts found in Acts 26, Acts 22, and Acts 9. These chapters are consistent. So he had to go to Damascus to find out what um, his assignment would be. Uh, meet with Ananias who laid hands on him, received the Holy um, assisting him in receiving the Holy Spirit, baptize him, and and where he would potentially and ultimately be received by the disciples. So Ananias' job was to sell the disciples on this. And can you imagine Ananias saying, man, if I'm wrong, I just got everybody murdered. Wow, what a place. What an opportunity to exercise faith and to hear from God about a matter. Okay, so... At Damascus, he also went for three days without eating or drinking. He went into fasting and then received his sight because on the road to Damascus, the light was so bright when the glory of, of Jesus shone upon him and blinded him. And so um, he needed the help of his, of his entourage to get to Damascus, plus he needed the help of Ananias to navigate his way. And so Ananias facilitated him getting his sight back through of the power of God. And so he did receive his, his sight, which Jesus had taken on the road to Damascus. So the phrase Damascus Road Experience is used to describe a conversion which is so dramatic and startling. Many people receive Christ in a life-changing 
instantaneous experience I did, although many others describe their conversion as more of a gradual understanding of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But those types of experiences have several things in common. First, salvation is of the Lord. So no matter how amazing the, the conversion was, every conversion is of the Lord. Okay. By his will and according to his plan and purpose. And so I found that in Acts the 22nd chapter the 14th verse. As he does one way or another to each, each of us. Jesus made it clear to Saul that he had gone his own way for long enough. Now he was to become an instrument in the hands of the master to do his will. As he had foreordained it. Wow. So even though. Saul was out there killing folks. Jesus before the foundation of the world, God before the foundation of the world, had chosen Saul to be Paul and to bring millions um, to Christ. And so, and so their ministries are still alive today through the Word. Of course, the Word, the Bible, is God-breathed, inspired, that men would write the will of God and but because of their obedience they have a part to play still to this day in many conversions and transformations to the faith so second the response of both Saul and all those who are redeemed by Christ is the same so let me read that again second the response of both Saul and all those who are redeemed by Christ is the same what do you want me to do like Saul we do not bargain, negotiate, question, or come halfway. The purpose or the response of the redeemed is obedience. And yeah, and so Saul got obedient real quick. When God truly touches our hearts, our only response can be, Lord, may your will be done, and may you use me to do it. Such was the experience of Saul on the Damascus road. Saul's dramatic conversion on the road to Damascus was the beginning of an incredible journey. And while not all conversions are as startling as Saul's, each of us is commissioned by Jesus to live in obedience to him according to John, the 14th chapter, 15th verse. Love one another in his name, according to 1 John, the 2nd chapter, the 23rd verse. Know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings becoming like him in his death according to Philippians 3 and 10 and tell the world of the wonderful riches in Christ can you imagine the plight of Paul as he exercises his newly found faith and belief in Jesus the Christ Paul had to constantly be in the habit of selling himself during the opportunities he had to engage crowds as depicted in Acts the 22nd chapter which I'm not going to read right now. I'm going to leave that to your reading time. He gives a detailed account. I might read it. He gives a detailed account of his conversion. It is believed that he began going by Paul in order to relate to other converts that he was a new man in Christ. He knew that most would be familiar with his reputation and wanted to create some distance between the old Saul and the newly converted. Christ having faith in Paul. <laughs> Imagine the level of faith that had to be exercised by those who would come to aid him in his new ministry of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. In closing, so I'm going to go ahead and close this puppy on out, man. God has given me and you a lot to chew on. So that's why God tells us not to judge because we don't know what the finished product is. God said that the work that he began in us, he would surely finish it in us. So when we judge another man, we are judging God's handiwork. We're judging the process. And who are we to judge the process of God? Okay, so we all know believers that are a hot mess, but they're in the, in the process of becoming what God said that they would be. So we can't judge. It's uncomfortable to be judged when you know that when you know that you are in a process. So in closing, Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus was one of the most amazing 
events in the whole Bible and is found to be historically accurate. Paul's conversion was so radical and complete that he goes on to be one of the most effective apostles in the whole biblical narrative as he would go on to write Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Philemon, Ephesians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, and Titus. Golly. And so, because of these God-inspired narratives and books in the Bible, many get saved because of the obedience of men like Saul to become Paul and such were some of you. So, some, you know, we've been a lot of things, but God isn't finished with you yet. One thing that we can judge is our own intentions, our own heart, but dare we not judge the work that God is doing in us or another man's journey. Yeah. God can save and use anyone. So if you are of the mindset that is too late for you or that you have just done way too much wrong to be used of God, think again. I consider myself like that old hammer in the toolbox. When I'm building something, I'd rather use the newer hammer, the newer one that I have in the box, the one that's old and used and rusty. Rather not use that, but the one that's old and used and rusty still has the same striking and pulling power than all the others, new and included. Just saying, okay. So we all get to a point of... Sometimes we're so grateful we just say, I'm unworthy. But Jesus' death on the cross made us worthy through his righteousness. And so I am that old hammer in the toolbox, and so are some of you. And so we can still strike a nail. Yeah, absolutely. We can still pull one out the wall. So think of yourself in that regard. And just because... You look old and rusty. Don't mean that you're not effective. Okay. I don't look old and rusty. I, don't, I hope I don't. Okay. So in Acts, the 20th chapter, the 19th verse, it says that Paul served the Lord with all humility and tears. Coming from a background of persecuting the people of God, he was often touched maybe with remorse from the things that he'd done to the point of tears, just holy sorrow. And not that he'd done this to men, but that he had done this to the one that he loves now, God, Jesus. And so I'll read it again. Acts 20, the 19th verse says that Paul served the Lord with all humility and tears. So the message that he gave in front of people was one so convincing that he was a major soul winner because they felt the genuineness of the Holy Spirit abiding in him through his humility and tears. A total transformation from what he was. Even though there seemed to be a remorseful gratitude in his teachings, he he, according to Acts, the 28th chapter, the 31st verse, preached the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence. No man forbidding him, referring to his zealous and bold attitude towards doing the will of Christ as should we all do and be. So, uh, just because he was humble and was often seen to cry during his sermons, don't get it twisted. Acts the 28th chapter 30 verse said that he did it with all confidence, no man forbidding him, referring to his zealous and bold attitude toward doing the will of Christ as we all should do and be. I got amazing information and, and not only did, did I get introduced to Paul in a new way, I got introduced to Saul 
in a new way, and such were some of you. <laughs> but I got introduced to Jesus in a new way on the road to Damascus. It was an amazing thing. Wow. So if this touched you or you got anything out of it, my prayer for you is that God would continue to deal with you and your road to Damascus conversion. That we would continue to develop in the in the will and the ways of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is my desire for me and you. If you're newly saved, make sure that you get a test to the hip of someone that is that is willing and capable of discipling you. Get yourself to a Bible-based church where they rightly divide the Word of God and begin your walk in true the way fashion. So, just in case, just tuning in, you've been listening to Word on the Street with JP. I'm your host, JP, and... Yeah, that's right. Until next time, we'll see you on the radio. You can't stop. Hey, can't stop, won't stop.